Charles Chaplin made the gold rush out of the most unlikely sources of inspiration for a comedy. The first idea came when he was viewing some stereoscopic pictures of the 1896 Klondike gold rush and was struck by the image of an endless line of prospectors snaking up the Chilkoot Pass. At the same time, he happened to read a book about the Donner Party disaster of 1846, when a party of immigrants, snowbound in the Sierra Nevada, were reduced to eating their own moccasins and the corpses of their dead comrades. Chaplin, proving his belief that tragedy and ridicule are never far apart, transforms these tales of privation and horror into a comedy in which his familiar tramp figure becomes a gold prospector, joining the mass of brave optimists to face all the hazards of cold, starvation, solitude and the occasional incursion of a grizzly bear. The idea took shape much quicker than was usual for Chaplin. This was the only one of his great silent comedies for which he began to shoot with a story fully worked out. Only two months after the premiere of his previous film, A Woman of Paris, he had sent a scenario for copyright and set his studio to work on building sets. Chaplin generally strove to separate his work from his private life, but in this case the two became inextricably and painfully mixed. Searching for a new leading lady, he rediscovered Lilita McMurray, whom he had employed as a pretty 12-year-old in The Kid. Still not yet 16, Lilita was put under contract and renamed Lita Gray. Chaplin quickly embarked on a clandestine affair with her, and when the film was six months into shooting, Lita discovered she was pregnant. Chaplin found himself forced into a marriage which brought misery to both parties, though it produced two sons, Charles Jr. and Sidney. The production was shut down for three months. Lita was replaced on the film by an enchanting new leading lady, Georgia Hale. With this unforeseen interruption and the distractions of the Chaplin's domestic tribulations, the production dragged on for almost a year and a half. It was in every respect the most elaborate undertaking of Chaplin's whole career. For two weeks, the unit shot on location at Truckee in the snow country of the Sierra Nevada. Here, Chaplin faithfully recreated the historic image of the prospectors struggling up the Chilkoot Pass. 600 extras, many drawn from the vagrants and derelicts of Sacramento, were brought by train to clamber up the 2,300-foot pass dug through the mountain snow. For the main shooting, the unit returned to the Hollywood studio, where a remarkably convincing miniature mountain range was created out of timber, a quarter of a million feet it was reported, chicken wire, burlap, plaster, salt and flour. The spectacle of this Alaskan snowscape, improbably glistening under the baking Californian summer sun, drew crowds of sightseers. In addition, the studio technicians devised exquisite models to produce the special effects which Chaplin demanded, like the miner's hut which is blown by the tempest to teeter on the edge of a precipice, for one of the cinema's most sustained sequences of comic suspense. Often it's quite impossible to detect the shift from model to full-size set. The gold rush abounds with now classic comedy scenes. When Charlie and his partner Big Jim, played by Max Swain, are snowbound and ravenous, Charlie cooks his boot with all the airs of a gourmet chef. In the eyes of the delirious Big Jim, he is transformed into a chicken, a triumph both for the cameramen, who did the elaborate trick work entirely in the camera, and for Chaplin, who magically becomes a bird. For one shot, another actor took a turn in the chicken costume, but it was unusable. No one else had Chaplin's gift for metamorphosis. The lone prospector's dream of hosting a New Year dinner for the beautiful dance hall girl provides the opportunity for another famous Chaplin set piece, The Dance of the Rolls. The gag had been seen in films before, but Chaplin gives unique personality to the dancing legs created out of forks and rolls. When the film was first shown, audiences were so thrilled by this scene that some theatres were obliged to stop the film, roll it back and perform an encore. The Gold Rush was the first of his silent films which Chaplin revived with the addition of sound for new audiences. In 1942, 17 years after the film's first release, he composed an orchestral score and replaced the intertitles with a commentary which he spoke himself. Among the scenes he trimmed from the film was the lingering final embrace with Georgia, with whom he'd maintained a long and often romantic off-screen friendship. 
Perhaps some private and personal feelings caused him to replace the kiss with a more chaste shot of the couple walking off, simply holding hands. Today, The Gold Rush appears as one of Chaplin's most perfectly accomplished films. Though he himself was inclined to be changeable in his affections for his own work, to the end of his life he would frequently declare that of all his films, this was the one by which he would most wish to be remembered. <laughs>